Hello, I'm Don O'Coin, theater critic for the Boston Globe. Welcome to the first conversation in a series that we're calling The Next Act, in which the Globe will seek out a broad range of voices from the arts community to talk about the road back from the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, and what the future might look like for performing arts organizations and their audiences. Very few industries face bigger challenges in rebounding from the pandemic than the performing arts industry. To talk about those challenges and what might have changed permanently or temporarily on the performing arts landscape, with us today we have Mark Volpe, the president and CEO of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, Michael Masso, managing director of the Huntington Theater Company, Don M. Simmons, executive director of Stage Source and artistic director of the Front Porch Arts Collective, Nico Nissanen, Artistic Director of Boston Ballet, and Esther Nelson, General and Artistic Director of Boston Lyric Opera. During today's event, we will be accepting questions live from our viewers. To submit a question, please use the Q&A button that you will see on the bottom of your screen. When submitting, please list which of the speakers you would like to direct your question to. Okay. Although our conversation is going to focus mainly on the future and the road ahead, I would be remiss if I didn't start by asking you about the personal impact of the upheavals of the past month uh, on you, on your colleagues, on the artists you work with. Given that the performing arts are driven by a personal passion, almost invariably, uh, and you're always building towards your next production and your next season, what has been the impact on you, your colleagues, and the artists you work with of having to come to a full and abrupt stop? And we go first to Don Simmons. <laughs> I was like, oh, I think this question's coming to me. <laughs> um, just had that feeling. I think um, for, for myself personally, um, I've actually been in a period where I have been working harder than I have worked before. Um, Leading Stage Source, which is an organization that serves theater professionals. We have over 200 organizational members and over 2,000 individual members. And trying to help them navigate this moment um, has kept our office moving, right? Trying to help people find, uh, figure out how to navigate unemployment, trying to help people navigate um, the CARES Act, helping them find work in this moment um, and helping to collectively message the impact of this moment on our community has kept us going a lot. Um, for the front porch, I think, right, um, my work there as artistic director, the thing for us is that we do so many co-productions and those were stopped abruptly right, with a couple of days notice trying to sort of pivot. And now we are in this place, like many um, performing arts organizations, where we have to try to figure out where do these shows go? What happens to the people that we were employing? Can we move them into the next season? Do we even know if we'll be able to gather? So we are playing some incredibly sophisticated games of Jenga right now, trying to figure out, are we opening in September? Is it January? Can we bring in 50 people? Is it 100 people? What does all of that look like? And then just personally, um, also as a freelance director, sort of uh, many projects that I was working on came to, again, a complete abrupt stop and sort of balancing that with the needs of the porch, the needs of stage source. How, um, how do those projects find life next year? Do they? How far are we pushing them back? Um, it has been, um, there's, it's just been a constant, um, sort of environment of pushing, pushing myself, pushing my employees and colleagues. Um, it, it's a fantastic moment. I'm not sure I'll have a full idea of what it is until we're out of it. Esther, does that sound, does that uh, mirror your experience and your emotions in some way? I, yes, I think definitely. Um, I think everything that you just heard is applies to us as well. We were in the middle of, um, uh, rehearsing our biggest show, which was Norma of the season. We got as far as the dress rehearsal and um, then we were shut down. And it's a little bit, you know, you work in our case, in all of our cases, you work on, on a project like that, a production for years. Uh, and it, it's like raising a child. It's, it goes through various stages. And by the time you get to rehearsal, it's like the child begins to walk. It's, it's becoming an adult. And, um, and then suddenly it, it was interrupted. So there is a, a kind of grief that sets in because 
um, it's essentially, it just disappeared. It's like a child walking in, into the darkness and it's gone, it's never to come back because that moment will never be recaptured. We were able to fortunately have an audio recording. But in our case, that's, you know, when we do a production, that's um, over 200 people uh, that are involved in one way or another, whether they're, our, there were, you know, 53 orchestra members, over 40 chorus, and then there's the entire production team plus the soloists who come together from all over. But the majority come from this community. And there is a sadness. And as soon as we, we haven't even recovered from that, we had to look at the next show and then it went um, away. And um, so that was also a new production. Again, uh, and, and you, you don't have time to grieve. And that's, I think, what I find from, with our artists. It's, and all of those who are directly impacted with the immediate plans, because you don't have time. You have to pivot and then you have to look at the future and look at all the variables uh, that we need to look at. And fortunately on that end, artists uh, and our industry is about creativity. And we, we, we know how to navigate, or we want to navigate out of uh, crisis situations. And so there is a tremendous sense in the moment of forward momentum about what can we do? What can we make this, how can we make this a better world within the creativity uh, that we have collectively um, in our community? I think I'm gonna come back to that question later. It's a good point, Miko. Well, you know, it, it was very interesting because it was so sudden, uh, you know, I have been in touch with people in Europe and I followed the, the virus and uh, eventually came here. We did a dress rehearsal the, the day of the opening night. I had to go on stage, tell everybody the show is not going to go on. We're going to postpone it. And, you know, it, it was a shock and it was a sort of a numbness that hit. Everybody dispersed. And of course, you know, then the next thing is, all right, uh, reassessing, you know, the situation. What do we do now? And you don't know. The news keep dribbling in and they're still coming in and uh, sort of start to say, all right, what are we going to do now in the short term? What about midterm? What about the really long term? You know, the stakes are incredibly high here. And then... How do you deal with individuals? How do you communicate with the organization? Naturally, we uh, had a waves of furloughs, lots of planning, uh, stress, this. So it has been a, a, quite a topsy-turvy time in many ways. Uh, surprisingly stressful and really numb. It's sort of a really, really high intensity, but I have to say um, a human beings have uh, been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. The whole organization and the artists coming together, you know, we, we're very much feeling like this, this was dumped on all of us and we are in it together. And uh, we don't know yet, but there will be something positive that will come out of this too at the end. Mark, you had to impose furloughs at the BSO. What's been the impact there? emotionally, psychologically, of coming to a full stop? Well, we, we haven't really come to a full stop. Uh, obviously, uh, I start with, you know, the, the notion that, that uh, you know, we have to have this incredible culture that we've spent, you know, decades building. And, and that, that, that culture is based on relationships. And, and frankly, communication has been absolutely critical. We, we've been you know, various, all the internal constituencies are external constituencies. So when I say we haven't come to a full stop, we, we have quickly shifted from uh, an entity that, that focuses primarily on presenting concerts here in New York, Tanglewood, the world. Uh, we were the, probably the first cultural institution to be impacted by this as we had concerts scheduled in Shanghai and Hong Kong and, and Seoul. Uh, uh, and, and so we, we, we announced that in January, probably not fully anticipating the impact it would have here. But I, I, I would say we have been in the process of, of morphing, if you will, uh, into a media company. And mm. what we've been doing here is working with the players. Some of it is, is archival, some of it is new material. Uh, we are constantly imagining what is possible, uh, you know, beyond what we have. We're obviously need, needing to negotiate rights in terms of stuff that is copyright protected and players, and that process has begun. Uh, but I, 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 I'm somewhat, you know, in, in a very emotionally challenging environment, <clears throat> somewhat reassured just, just in the first month, we've had over three and a half million people 
access the BSO through, through our, our video uh, streams, our audio streams, our social media platforms. So, so uh, not, not the, the revenue model doesn't quite work. I, I don't want to suggest uh, uh, that, that uh, we are, uh, you know, we're continually focused on, on how we emerge as, as well as how we, how we uh, ultimately pr produce content and disseminate it. Uh, obviously, we can't do it in terms of live audiences, so we're doing it electronically. Interesting. I want to return to that subject of the development of the virtual space, but Michael, could you weigh in here? Sure. Um, my calendar, which is uh, relentless and has no feelings, reminds me that you and I, <laughs> tonight, were supposed to be at the opening night of The Bluest Eye, uh, Lydia Diamond's adaptation of uh, Toni Morrison's great novel. And uh, obviously that's not happening for some time. And when we froze in March, we were about a week away from first performances of Kirsten Greenwich's um, play, Our Daughters Like Pillars. And you, you talk about the impact on artists. Um, that was a world premiere of a play that the author had been working on for years. Uh, this is a five year process for her. And she had a production and she had a gorgeous cast and she was deeply involved and engaged in this process. And suddenly it's frozen in a way that is enormously frustrating. Um, we've said we're gonna get back to it in a year and we've given it dates. But that experience is duplicated um, by thousands and thousands of people around the world, tens of thousands of people whether it's their, it was gonna be their Broadway debut or there was, was gonna be their little theater debut. Um, and you know, all we can do is we still are committed to those artists and we're still committed to the art form that, um, that they engage in, which is the, the, the generous act of presenting uh, live performances to groups of people. We gather for a living and this is a very challenging time. You know, our staff is um, working to try to figure out uh, the future, but it's obviously a very unsettling time for anybody who works in our organizations. Mm -hmm. And you know, what's interesting for, for those of us who have some leadership responsibilities, I, I don't know about everybody else, but there's something about the last three or four weeks, six weeks, but some energy which is about sort of a war footing. Like, you know that there's work to do, and you know that we have to think are most creatively and are most compassionately in order to get through to the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my concern is at some point, you, you, the adrenaline is gone and you're dealing with um, the implications of what's to come in the next year. And I think that will be um, honestly even harder. Yeah, Michael said, I want to build on that point and go to you, John. Michael said, we gather people for a living. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. Are you confident, Don? I'd love to hear all of you on this, that people will want to gather again. That people will feel safe doing so. Baron and Stage announced yesterday they're going to reopen in August. One production, one third capacity. Everybody wears masks. Uh, are people going to feel safe even under those constraints? Yeah. So I would break that question apart. I think absolutely people are gonna to wanna to gather again, right? We wanna gather now. <laughs> we desperately wanna do it now. I think the, the second part, when will people feel safe to do it? What are the steps that all of our organizations are putting in place to make sure that people feel safe? Like that, that's gonna be a process that takes time. Um, and so, right, for the organizations that sort of uh, dip their toe into that pond um, as they do it, uh, I, I am wishing them the best, right? I think there are so many resources available to all of us uh, from the city, from the state, from the art service organizations and each other. Um, mm -hmm. I think as everybody has said, this is such a resilient and creative community that we can all sort of lean on each other um, to talk about best practices and how we think this should go. Um, but again, right, our constituencies um, are in those danger zones, right? Um, so I think it's gotta be a slow and measured process, but Yes, I think people, people are looking forward to it. And if that means we start outdoors and if that can work, right, then I think it's that idea, like Esther said, of pivoting. How do we pivot to start there? Um, and what does it look like when we need to take a break and reassess and then get back into it? 
Okay, well, I want to get back to the point Don raised, at least implicitly, about resources as, as regards the public sector. But Esther, to you now, please. Are you confident that people will want to gather again as of old? I think the essence of all of our art form, forms collectively is the coming together of artists and our community in real time and real space. If we cannot do that, from my end, I will say we are no longer Boston Derrick Aquan. But that's the essence, and that has been part of our human condition and desire, I think, probably since man crawled out of the cave, if that's what he crawled out of. But uh, it's, it's that coming together in collective storytelling, and that is what we all do in some way or some form, an artistic shape. It has to be, because I, th I believe strongly that um, it, it, this has gone on for millions of years uh, through all kinds of pandemics and epidemics and natural disasters, and here we are. Mm -hmm. I think we've been quite spoiled, actually, in the last hundred years, because uh, even in the 19th century, we read plenty about cholera epidemics, yellow fever epidemics that have impacted and advanced urban planning and impacted theaters as well. So mm -hmm. I think going back to your question, it's, I, I look at it in two ways. Number one is the coming out of this, this current situation. And I would say that probably when there's a vaccine and some additional health measures, we will come back to want to gather in the, in the form that is closer to what we're used to. Though I will say that I think longer term, I see this more as an impact as it has in past when you look at past patterns of epidemics in terms of space planning. Because I think for a hundred years, we haven't had to worry about that so much. So we've uh, piled up people in our theaters uh, backstage. I think there will be a lingering longer term impact as to how we view space and that is part of urban planning and public, part of the responsibility of our public officials. But that, I think, is something we have to concern ourselves with. Short term, even more so. Even short term, we have to look at how do we come together, whether it's outdoors, whether it's spacing apart. Uh, fortunately, on our end, um, we've been doing installations for a long time, which now it seems to be the silver lining in our condition. Uh, so we're very used to uh, going into non-traditional spaces and uh, we, co we, we design our own seating. So we can make it whatever you wish. You can do the backstage area, whatever it is. That's what we've been doing for a number of years. So fortunately, I think that is happening. At the same time, we are looking at alternatives of virtual, as Mark mentioned, uh, entertainment. And I think increasingly we are now, that's doing that while we're doing that short term, that too will have a longer lasting impact in terms of how do we view this with an investment in the future? How does that allow us to reach constituents and communities uh, in the future with what we do that always have been kind of isolated uh, and work together with libraries, with community centers? How can we reach these communities that uh, will continue to be in one form or another isolated for one or another reason that we now establish a connectivity to that? So I look at that as very much additive okay. and not as a replacement. Thank you. Uh, Michael, could you address the question with the, with the added question of limited capacity means a reduction in revenues. Can you survive, bluntly, with one-third capacity for three shows in a row, if that's what it comes to? Um, I, well, three shows in a row is one thing, but I no, we can't survive on limited capacity and to do the work that we do. And also the experience. If you think about, I mean, I, I admire Barrington for taking a whack at this. So somebody has to do it. And, you know, um, so just imagine what the level of programming. They're programming a, a one person play because they don't want to crowd the stage. They don't want to put a performance at risk. Um, and for, for, you know, for under 200 people. Imagine if you want to share um, a comedy. Imagine if you want to do Shakespeare. Imagine if, I mean, there are, there, the, the, the range of possibility under that structure is so narrow that mm -hmm. it's a stopgap. And I appreciate them having the flexibility to do the stopgap, but it's not, it's not the answer. Um, and certainly um, there's no financial viability for us um, trying to put 150 people in an 800 seat theater or trying to put 50 people in a 350 seat theater. Uh, I don't think that's the answer. And we have to, I certainly believe that people will um, uh, come back in a very similar way. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have to accommodate, that doesn't mean we have to learn something for years about cleaning, about, um, uh, about other protocols in place. 
But I also don't think that's likely to happen um, for some time. And so we just have to be prepared um, and be patient in addition to being smart about how we gather people when we do again. Certainly when we start producing plays again, it will not look different. It will not look the same as it did. But that I think will also change the experience in a way which is not to its advantage. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, uh, we will adapt, but we're, we're really looking forward to the return to, to the norm because that's, that's, it is fundamental to the experience of our art form. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark and Nico on this, along a similar vein, but with this added wrinkle, the director of the um, CDC has said there might be a second wave of this that could be even worse if it coincides with the flu epidemic. Have you done any planning for that terrible eventuality and how big a blow would that be to, is survival then at stake for certain organizations? I, I think until there's really a vaccination, the, the notion of, of, of people congregating in large groups. And, and, and I don't think, candidly, outdoor is necessarily the panacea. R recognize we've had upwards of a half a million people on the Esplanade, uh, you know, watching a Boston Pops and a fireworks show. I, I, I obviously were in conversations with the governor and his staff as to whether, whether that's prudent to, to uh, do this year. And you can only imagine, not, not, not for me to announce. Uh, at least in this this context. Uh, so so I, I think you know I, I I totally agree with Esther. I, I, I the only thing exception I would say I don't, I don't think it was a man that crawled out of the cave first. I think it was a woman. But 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 that that aside, thank you. Yeah, I, I, you know people are social. People want to be part of a community. Obviously, the, the massive migration over over generations to cities and and all that cities have to offer, which we're very much part of. That would suggest, you know, once there's a vaccination, once uh, once people uh, get comfortable congregating, you know, recognize at some point we'll know the duration of this pandemic with the vaccinations. At some point, we'll have a sense of, of the intensity. What we don't know is 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 how long it's going to take for people uh, who are all creatures of habit to 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 feel uh, that that they can safely be with you know thousands of others in in, in the same space. Uh, you know, and, and, and begs the question in the interim, what, what do you do? And I've already referenced, if you look at how the sports people are, are, are thinking, they're talking about playing games, assuming they have appropriate testing uh, and, and, and having uh, no, no crowds and, and basically relying on media revenue. Uh, you know, they, they, they obviously have a certain advantage in terms of generating media revenue, but I, I, I think there's something to be learned from that. And, and we're certainly considering that. Uh, if, if we can't have uh, audiences, how, how do we have live content? Uh, and, 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 and it was amazing seeing the stats on the uh, NFL draft. People were just so desperate for something live, something you know, where there's mystery, where there's suspense. And, and that's part of what we offer in live performances. And I think uh, ultimately, I think we're going to have to be, figure out a way to do that and, and electronically disseminate it. And, and share it with, with the, you know, whatever audiences and, and what the business model for that is, is yet to be fully explored. But, but uh, I, I think, you know, at, at some point, I agree, we're going to reemerge and we're going to learn a lot. And, and the reference to war, that's probably, I've, I've, I've obviously of a generation where I never really experienced that, but, but, but the expression fog of war, I think is germane here because you don't really know in, in the war, you talk to people who have actually been involved uh, and, and, and and, and battle scenes and, and it's so confusing and, and so, so, so much that doesn't quite get sorted out. And I think that that, uh, that, that metaphor actually applies here because we just don't know. None of us are omnipotent or omniscient. So, so ultimately, you know, I think it comes down to culture and your relationships and how you emerge out of this will depend on how strong, uh, 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 you know, that, that you have these connections with your audience, connections with your staff and, and artists and, and connections with your community. Yeah, that's actually a good pushing off point for Miko. If you could address this, live questions are starting to stream in. And Robert asks, aside from audiences, how do we make our artists feel safe again? I imagine they'll be eager to get back to work, but at the same time, they might feel reluctant and vulnerable. I mean, you are all employers. You all, you know, have people who work for you who want to feel safe while doing what they love to do. How do you strike that balance, Miko? Well, it's... Uh... 
it is a safety for all. It has to start there. I, I think the first step is really to get serious testing and isolate the people who are sick. You know, uh, we can wait for the vaccine, but I think there are steps that need to be taken prior. Uh, I also know people want to get together. Uh, what makes performing art so special, it is a communal experience with people experiencing the live performance. And that's where the magic is. So, um, I, and it, it's a pleasurable experience. It's, so for me, imagining a theater at the third capacity with the masks, I don't see much fun about it. I also uh, want to point to the economic realities. None of these shows make money. We have a one production a year, The Nutcracker, that generates some revenue. Everything else loses lots of money. If we keep running our organizations and losing and losing and losing, you know, I mean, I already see the bottom of the barrel, uh, you know, uh, when you ask what happens with this, if there's a second wave, that's going to be dark times. The, the kind of decisions that are going to be evaluated at that point, you know, it's like I think about them, but I don't want to think about them. That's what keeps me up in the night. If you can't do the nutcracker, what would be the impact on your finances? Would, it, would then viability itself be in question? Damn close. Interesting. Well, I guess that brings us to the, the public sector, the sort of perennial but more pressing than ever question about the public sector support for the arts. And I'd like to begin with Bob on this as well. Um, in terms of extending a lifeline to performing arts organizations and artists, what is the obligation of city, state, and federal government uh, at this point? What are you seeing or not seeing from them? Uh, well, I would say actually I'm, I'm seeing quite a bit right now. Um, and it has been, incredibly encouraging to see, especially with the city of Boston, um, what Cara Elliott Ortega is doing with her office to keep people in constant contact with each other, in conversation with each other. Um, the city is holding uh, weekly meetings, I believe on Tuesdays and Fridays, Fridays for organizations, Tuesdays for individuals, um, having folks in the performing arts community share out resources, right? Um, like the stage source um, works in conjunction with the theater community benevolent fund to um, administer artist relief. The same with the dance Alliance, the record company is doing similar things and she is making sure that that information is getting out to everybody. Um, and then the incredible work of the MCC and mass creative in explaining to us what we should be doing as artists and organizations in terms of advocacy um, so that we are speaking to our representatives and really sort of demonstrating the need. Um, I think one of the things that we're constantly talking about and that a lot of folks think like that arts as a uh, nice to have, not a need to have, but right, like there's not a single one of us I think right now that would not wish we could leave our domiciles um, and go to the movies, go to a live performance, right? Um, I cannot tell you all the things that like were already on my calendar and sort of like Michael was saying, our calendars are, they have no feelings <laughs> and they're just ticking off all of the things that we're missing. And I have, I have appreciated how hard, right, the city and state agencies are working to get us back to and to share information on who is still producing and who has moved to a new platform so that we can continue to enjoy these things. Um, so I would say, I mean, I think the obligation of these um, agencies are high, but I think they are doing everything to rise to the challenge. I want to ask the same question of Esther, but I want to preface it with a, an interesting data point from Globe Art critic Murray White, quite recently wrote a front page piece that noted all told 21 million people go to the theater, visit a museum, or buy a ticket for a concert in Greater Boston over a typical year four times as many as those attending every single home game of Boston's four major sports teams. Uh, Murray's piece also noted that uh, non nonprofit cultural organization contributed 2.3 billion with a B to the state economy last year and account for 71,000 full-time equivalent jobs each year. Is that adequately understood on Beacon Hill, Esther? And do the appropriations correspond to that fact? Are you asking me? Yes. 
Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, I, first of all, I want to echo um, the, what, what we talked about in terms of the city of Boston really rising to the occasion in, 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 in gathering all of us together as a community and sharing information. Um, what, what, what I think is where, where we have a disconnect here generally, and that's not here in Boston or Massachusetts alone, it's around the country, is that, that we, we tend to view arts as a, um, a non-essential luxury. And when, when it's actually deeply part of our human condition, it is what makes us um, uh, human and um, makes life enjoyable and, uh, and um, uh, valuable, but it also contributes significantly to communities in ways that are not actually even measurably economically. So I think we have this somewhat disconnect and, and that's a greater problem, but unfortunately at this point that is really impacting us in the sense that um, we are not considered to be as important, for instance, even as sports, though you, you indicated that actually the economic impact is, is greater in many ways. So I think we, we collectively have to do a much better job of bringing this, uh, communicating this out, not only to, to our, and on the national level, but here locally. So in, within that mix, I would say we have, a, we have an uphill battle, not only with the state on Beacon Hill, but we, we do with the community as well. Boston, I think, further is burdened by the fact that we have relatively uh, small support base for the performing arts. So you have fewer foundations, major foundations, that those that we have are very generous, but there are not enough of them, unlike comparable cities around the country. So that, that's a real problem. We also have relatively small public support. Um, and I would say all around, and also the impact of that to the larger organizations is probably more, is magnified as a result. So the, the, the so we have a public funding issue and that has to be addressed. To Miko's point earlier, uh, that it's, if this continues, there's going to have to be a lifeline uh, for many arts organizations and that has to be financial. But I'm more concerned even at this point about uh, the, the communication that's coming out uh, of our, from our public officials as we enter this new world. What does it mean to provide a safe working environment? So unless we have very, very clear directive, then that's going to be confusing and the liability issues are going to be enormous for each one of us. For instance, those of us who have uh, for, for an opera to, to, to produce an opera is just enormous in terms of people. It's between a full orchestra, big chorus and soloists and backstage, you're looking upward to 200 to 300, uh, upward to 300 people. Now we can shrink some of that, certainly, but, but not down to one or 10 or 20. Mm -hmm. It's just not possible. People have to get together uh, and she, by makeup, costumes, rehearsal areas. So unless safety uh, conditions are, are provided in terms of directions, and there's also a financial assistance in order to provide it accurately, it's, we're gonna face a liability issue in addition to the financial burdens that will not make it possible. Yeah, I'd like to get back to that, but first I wanna go Miko and Michael and Mark on this, if the foundations are not uh, maybe there in adequate numbers and and legislature waxes and wanes in terms of its support. What kind of assistance can your audiences provide to you in this hour of critical need? And how have you had to re-engage that calibrate? It seems like this is a about as stiff a test between an institution and its audiences as can be conceived. Uh, so how does that play into the financial rescue aspect of this, your relationship with your audiences? Well, I, I would uh, suggest, I think many of us have been quite uh, reassured, gratified to see so many people converting uh, tickets that they bought for events and, and converting that into either a donation or a commitment for a subsequent performance ne next season. So, so cer certainly uh, that, that matters. I, I think we all have fiduciaries. And, and as we, you know, there's this notion that uh, Lee Iacocca, who I knew very well from my Detroit days, used to say equality of sacrifice. Uh, and, and many of us have, have had to furlough uh, staff. Many of us had to cut the salaries of artists. And to the credit, I think, of, of many of the fiduciaries, I think there's now sort of a call to arms and, 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 and to basically one of their primary responsibilities is, is to provide financial uh, equilibrium, uh, and especially in tough times. So I think uh, we'll see folks uh, stepping up. I, I, I would be, uh, you know, there is public sector 
support through the PPP program uh, that, that benefited many cultural institutions. Unfortunately, you know, ones that had over 500 employees and the BSO candidly has 1300 employees. You know, we've been talking to the Met Opera, Chicago Symphony, there, there's seven uh, major cultural institutions, mostly concentrated uh, in, in New York, uh, LA and Chicago, but, but we, we part of that group that are trying to figure out uh, how, how we can uh, make the case in an advocacy context. Uh, City Ballet is in that as, as well. They have over 500 employees. And, and, and also that economic impact study, especially in a congressional, you know, we, we as you noted, Don, collectively in Boston are, are, are a significant part of the economy, been quantified. We brought in a Williams professor uh, to, to do it for us individually. And, and we're close to a quarter of a billion dollars in economic impact recognizing we sell about 52, $53 million worth of tickets. So it's, there's a multiplier there. And, and candidly, uh, you, you take Tango out of the Berkshires, that, that's the summer economy. I mean, that, that's what's so, so torturous about this decision that we're having to contemplate. Uh, and, and I know it's an outdoor venue, but you have 18,000 people uh, or, or 15,000 or 12,000, whatever number, uh, obviously, and certainly artists are people too. And so uh, consistent with what Miko was saying, you know, uh, those artists are, are you know, on stage and how, how close. So, so we're, we're grappling with all that, recognizing our obligation is to, to the institution, to our staff, to our, our artists, to, uh, but it, to our public, but it, it's also to the economic well-being of the Commonwealth. Okay, Michael, and then Miko, what do the audience's role in this? And what message you are sending them and what message they're sending you? Well, the message they're sending us is, is one of enormous dedication and, and commitment. And, you know, we hear from people who are worried about us personally. Um, uh, we, similar to what Mark was saying, we've had the overwhelming majority of those people who have um, had tickets to cancel performances have understood that the gesture of donating those tickets is both um, psychological and real financial impact. We've had hundreds of thousands of dollars of tickets that have been turned back to us. And that certainly helps us think about um, the future. Um, we've had an interesting, um, uh, uh, we have had, as Mark says, fiduciaries. We've had trustees who, of course, want to step forward in a financial way. We have a, we have a letter writing campaign of trustees who are writing letters of appreciation to individual staff members and vice versa. Um, we have an engagement of deep, we, we, we had a video that our board put together, um, how I don't know, uh, a video card that lasted 10 minutes of, of appreciation for the commitment and the talent and the sacrifice of our staff. So we're feeling in both the larger sense and in the much smaller um, uh, sense, enormous appreciation uh, for what we do. And I think that makes an enormous amount of difference. Um, what the government, um, you know, I think there are two things. First of all, um, there's this enormous uncertainty and we could all make better decisions if there were a path to some understanding and commitment and a time frame. That doesn't mean that it's possible for government officials to do that, but mm -hmm. as soon as there's some knowledge base, obviously sharing that information, giving us an understanding, giving us a time frame um, would be enormously helpful. That I think is a hard, hard thing to do. But then you come back to financial. So um, the other day was we were preparing for this, I think it was Mark who said, uh, the Wall Street Journal said that the top two industries that are gonna be negatively impacted by uh, this pandemic are number one, the, the airlines, and number two, it's, it's the entertainment. I don't know whether that was live performance or entertainment, whatever Mark was saying. Um, there is obviously, an enormous amount of money that's going to be dedicated to the airlines. There should be an enormous amount of financial support dedicated to our industry, to our role in the life of not just cities, and Mark's certainly right, you know, we are as gathering places, we are central to the experience 
of why people live in cities. We are part of that whole makeup with restaurants, with, you know, with our, our peers. And I'm certainly not willing to give up on Jordan Hall or Symphony Hall or the Huntington as a gathering space in any time in the near future. Um, and, and, and so that has to be recognized, our role in the community. And we will see. Uh, we're not very good at making that case, is, is the truth. We have not been very good nationally. We are not really that good locally at making the case. We haven't been that successful. But the case is there to be made. And we're an enormous industry, both for the financial impact and for, frankly, the societal impact that we have every day. And that needs to be supported. Thank you, Miko. I full heartedly agree with uh, Michael and Mark, uh, how generous the audiences have been. And it's been really wonderful to see how sticky they are. And, uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I, I think it's also very important to remember that arts are also very much about self-reflection. It's not this luxurious thing. It has incredible impact on our health and spiritual well-being. And um, it, it's essential part of it fully having the human experience on this earth. So I just can't imagine, let's say, Boston without arts. It's very, very scary. We're getting a lot of questions uh, from readers about how and whether each organization is supporting their performers financially during this time. I mean, what is, how does that work? If someone is cast in a play or an opera or so supposed to perform in a symphony and gets canceled, are they financially supported by the organization in some fashion? Is there an obligation over the next X number of months to make sure people are not starving, who are banking on a paycheck? from your organizations? I, I will share, we have obviously uh, unions involved and we have the players represented by a union and we've, uh, in probably two 20 minute meetings, we, we uh, came to conclusion that they would uh, accept and 75% and of what they would normally make and they voted unanimously uh, for that. It's a little more challenging for us with artists because we hire artists as independent contractors and their force majeure clauses and all those. So, so uh, Andres and Keith, I'm predisposed and we are uh, with the fiduciary support uh, providing some financial, uh, they've taken significant cuts, but, but they, 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 they are still being compensated. All the other artists, the Yo-Yo Ma's of the world, the others who were scheduled to perform with us uh, are, are not being paid by the Boston Symphony, which is basically in the orchestra field, an industry practice. When I talk to my colleagues in Chicago, New York, LA, none of us are paying uh, guest artists. Michael, how's it working at the Huntington? So we were in performance um, for, um, for production, uh, for, uh, for Kirsten Greenwich's play, um, Our Daughters Like Pillars. And um, the day we sent everybody home, we sent them home with a check for four weeks pay. Um, uh, it's, it's tricky now for future productions where we, where we have no, um, we haven't engaged people yet. We haven't contracted them. I mean, so much of we, what we do in the theater, we don't have many commitments that are made years in advance or months in advance. We, you know, some people we know, we know people who we think will be in a place a year from now, but we don't have, um, agreements with them. And so we don't have any structure to really talk to them until we're ready to bring them back to work. But certainly the artists who were engaged with us at that moment, we felt an obligation to do more than say, um, it's a force majeure, you know, situation and, and you're going home. That was above and beyond contractual terms, but it was something that we thought uh, needed, needed to be done. Esther and Nico? Well, we, we, we similarly, um, we, we were in the midst, as I said, of our production and we were in a press rehearsal. So we, we immediately gathered, that was before we had any, any PPP uh, possibility. And so we immediately um, decided with our boards, uh, a, a great support, that we would be paying 100% of the fees. And uh, that's, again, we're, we're looking here in, in the, you know, we have three unions we deal with 
three groups of artists. So that's in the aggregate a lot, quite a bit. But uh, that was our moral obligation, absolutely, and there was no question about it. In terms of the other productions that um, we had planned for the season, for which we do have contracts, we are currently um, looking at what the best strategy is and the best, um, um, because now we have a PPP loan as well, so that, that falls within that period. So we're currently looking at the best scenario there. Again, it will be whatever it is, it's going to be above and beyond what we were obligated to pay. And then we have contracts for the future as well. So we're an industry that does contract uh, quite, quite a bit out. And so depending on what we're going to do, which is still up in the air, that there will be conversations about that too. And I will say that in, in addition to the um, economic factors here. Our, our artists here are an, an enormous part of our culture here and, our, and our, uh, their residents, the majority, other than the guest artists that we're all bring in. The, our musicians, for instance, overlap with the symphony, they overlap with the ballet, uh, we, we use actors collectively and we share our resources. So for, for many of them, in our chorus sings in, you know, they sing in other groups, they sing in churches and synagogues, they're teachers, they are very much part of collectively between all of us. There is a, there, we, we represent a major sector um, in, our, in our community that, um, that make our community better in many ways besides our institutions. And uh, so collectively, just take one musician who might have lost uh, engagement with the ballet, maybe two with us, maybe a couple with the symphony. That, that collectively, that loss for the spring probably might represent the majority of the income for a year. So this is, this is significant for, for all the many artists. And if we, we as institutions don't stand by and behind the artists and the production personnel in our community, the community at large will suffer in a much larger, to a much larger degree in the ecosystem than, than just with our institutions. Nico? Uh, if, if I highlight the example of our dancers, of course, uh, you, one that needs to know our dancers are uh, part of the American Guild of Musical Artists. And we employ them for 40 weeks a year minimum. If we have international touring, sometimes that can go further. So uh, right after we decided to postpone our Carmen program, uh, they were uh, on a salary couple of weeks, but then, since then um, they have been on unemployment and I'm very happy that the government has had this additional unemployment benefit on top of that um as, as as i mentioned 40 weeks usually uh, annual employment they are summertime unemployed on un unemployment anyway this time uh it's much better so i'm happy that i don't feel like it squeezes them so much from the financial point of view and uh, what we tried to do also we didn't just cut the weeks we moved uh, three weeks from this season to the front of the next season. We, we are still uh, hoping that in August, um, the Carmen program would go on. But as you know, everybody knows the times are very, very unknown. That decision will be made later. Uh, one thing we were, able to, we were able to do, usually we pay 50% of the health insurance. We, we decided that we will pay 100% of the health insurance from now on until uh, the fall when we start again. Okay. Uh, what the endeavor you're all involved in is making art. And I'd like to ask you to weigh in on sort of what is art's job at a time like this? What kind of art you think will grow out of this crisis? Tony Kushner comes to mind. He wrote Angels in America in response to the AIDS crisis. What kind of art do you think will come out of this crisis? And what kind of art are your audiences looking for and begin with Don, uh, who's a playwright as well as a working director. Is working a lot of the sides of this equation you're involved in. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on yeah. what is art's job at a time like this? Um, right, it's uh, the mirror up to nature, right? I think art's job is to help us process everything that is happening around us um, and give us a safe space and creative space and sometimes an unsafe space to do that. Right. Um, it, it helps us process things when we can't ordinarily process uh, maybe on our own or or even together. Right. There is that alone together is a thing that I keep hearing right now. And I think art has the opportunity to allow us to do that. 
Um, and I think that's what's so lovely about art in live spaces is that I can be in a room, dangerous as this sounds, breathing the same air <laughs> as the people around me and know that we are going through something collectively um, and that that experience is going to stay with me and challenge my thinking um, and, and open up my thinking. And I think that is what this time um, allows us. I know like looking at the new play exchange, um, several people have said like within the first three weeks, there were like 200 new plays all about the pandemic. And Richard um, did his Apple family thing a few nights ago, or tonight actually, the public. Tonight, yep. Thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I would love to see, right, I think art will, uh, right, how we challenge ourselves, how we start to incorporate the things that we're learning right now, um, mm -hmm. right, because we do everything live, figuring out how to incorporate the digital, um, I think figuring out how we're incorporating and using space differently, um, right, is going to be, uh, it can be, a fun challenge. And my hope is that because so many of us are in conversations with each other, this room right now, some of the other rooms that we're all, all of these virtual rooms that we're in, that there will be more cross collaboration, at least um, in uh, the city proper and within Massachusetts that theater starts to reach out to dance more, that we all start to reach out to the music community more and um, at all levels and across disciplines and aesthetics. That is, that is the thing that I am looking forward to and hoping for. Yeah, I remember you said to me a few weeks ago, Don, people are coming out of their silos. Yes. Uh, yeah, like. this crisis has forced that. Michael, I mean, this is just a follow-up, but basically you spoke about Kirsten Greenidge's middle career having to be postponed. And I want you, all of you to address this question, if you would, but when you come back with the revenue base much shakier than it was before, are you going to feel constrained from introducing new work, from commissioning new work? Are you going to feel as though now is the time to play it safe with an audience? <coughs> Well, um, so I don't, th I don't think so at all. Um, you know, the, the day after, um, the day after 9-11, we reopened our production. We, we took a one day pause and opened. We actually had opening night of a play. It was Richard, Rich, speaking of Richard Nelson, Richard yeah. Nelson's um, musical adaptation of James Joyce's The Dead. And it's a piece of enormously deep emotional resonance. And it's about living life to the fullest and it seems so appropriate and it was one of the great experiences of my life and the most moving moments in the theater that i've ever had and we're missing that moment but that moment will come this is a longer pause but we need to get back to that moment and when you're in the theater you know one of the great values of the theater is is the empathy that that it 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 trains us for that it allows us to have for people on stage um and solace that we take from understanding the human condition better. And there will be new plays. Our commitment to new plays is profound and fundamental to the DNA of the Huntington. We will continue to do new plays, but of course this will generate new plays. This will generate new passions. Yes, Richard Nelson, who writes about the moment that we're living in, that's pretty fast. But yeah. there, will be, there will be great works of art that are generated by this suffering. Um, and it's not an excuse for the suffering. It's not, an, uh, 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 it's not a recommendation. It is simply the fact is that out of, out of challenge comes artists who teach us about who we are and how we rose to the occasion and where we failed. And we will be part of that when those plays come along. I, I, would, I would add, Don, you know, absolutely, you know, solace, joy, empathy, but, but there, you know, and new work is ab absolutely part of the DNA of, of, of many of the institutions you're, you're addressing. But I, I will point out anecdotally just one thing historically. When, when the, the Nazis were about to take Leningrad and Shostakovich sat in a little room and was able to... Oh, Mark. And, and ultimately it was played in, in a radio context. It rallied a whole nation. Uh, and and Mark, several months later, we, a lost little, you, we lost you there for a minute. Uh, could you just fill in the gap there? We lost you for about 30 seconds when you were describing okay. I apologize, Don. Uh, Shostakovich wrote a symphony, number seven, during the siege of Leningrad. And, and it was never performed, well, it was performed many, many times for public. But the first performance was over the radio to rally the Russian people. 
and our connection to the piece is Kusevitsky brought it to Tanglewood the next summer. We had a benefit, and believe it or not, Boston Symphony donated you know, thousands of dollars to the Russian war relief. Can, can you imagine that in today's context? Uh, right. it, it, it just reinforces, you know, when, when uh, uh, Michael mentioned, you know, 9-11, uh, having the, you know, when the, the mayor asked uh, the, the, the Boston Symphony to participate in the, in the memorial service for the flight crews on, in City Hall and the plaza there with Bette Midler and stuff. I mean, it, all, all these occasions where, where the country comes together involve the arts uh, yep. and, and 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 so so uh, and, and michael's right this is different than 9 11 9 11 the next day you could get out and and, and do what you need to do Th this pause is using michael's words verbatim is longer but when we come out of this i i think the value of what we do the impact of what we do the emotion of what we do is going to be even more impactful esther and miko could you weigh in on this are people going to be looking for consolation escapism challenge go well, deep crisis well, I, I think, you know, the key is to stay true to our art form. I think safe is death. And I, I think the art that you're going to put out there is going to be real. I have no problem any time when people uh, use art as an escapism. You know, that's totally fine. But uh, lowering the par and uh, doing uh, entertainment, populist things, it's, it's not... Not at all. World premieres, yes, perhaps with a little different budgets. We, you know, the quality of the art and, and, and the mighty dollar relation doesn't always work like that. Esther? I, I agree. I, I think I'm not at all worried about what art form is going to come out of it because it's just will, because that's what artists and creators do. And it's going to be the whole spectrum. It's going to be reflective. Some of it is going to be tragic. Some of it is sad. Uh, and some of it will be really funny. It's going to have the whole, some of it's going to be small uh, because that's probably how we're going to start. And eventually some of it will be big again. And yes, in our end, we certainly are committed to, to new works because we're living art form. Composers live today, not only, in the, they're not only decomposing. So um, we are a current art form and that's actually where the most energy is coming from right now. Even right now, we're looking at commissioning a piece, for instance, of a, of a composer that, um, or multiple composers actually, it's a little bit like a television series that will be uh, presented. It's commissioned, it's going to be performed in a safe place. It may be all virtual, it may be somewhat virtual. It's actually designed to be adaptive. What, what's so great is listening to some of the artists, and that's, I think, as leaders, I, I have learned that in crisis situations, the best thing you can do is actually be quiet and listen. And listen to your community, to your patrons, and to your artists. And there are, you know, we may not know definite answers, but you begin to sense that there, there, there's maybe not even data, but there's signals all around us right now and that's what's exciting about it as well. We have to keep going, or otherwise you, you're, bur you're burying yourself in a hole. We will come out of it because we must. In the meantime, there will be some exciting things happening and there'll be all kinds of different uh, things across the spectrum. Yeah, that word different, we're in our last couple of minutes here. I guess I'd ask you to all weigh in, if you could, briefly on how the landscape is likely to look different, how your art forms are gonna respond to this moment that'll make the experience for the audience, for the artists, the institution different when and if uh, performing arts venues, when they reopen. Uh, Dawn, you begin, please. Um, I, I wish I had a good answer for that. I think that because, right, the performing arts organizations, they run the gamut, right, from budgets of $5,000 to right upwards of $2 million. Um, and that's going to look different uh, what each person is capable of, which what each organization is capable of and individual artists, so different. Um, things that I keep hearing about, things that I'm foreseeing, uh, more collaboration, right? Um, like we said, across disciplines, across aesthetics, I think um, sharing of space, the idea of doing things in rep with other organizations. Mm -hmm. um, I think we are seeing like nationally, um, a lot of the individual artists sort of rising to this occasion of creating art right now. And so mm -hmm. it, it's quite possible that, that we are going to see more sort of great small works 
um, by, by those folks come to the forefront. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know, um, at least for me, I think uh, the jury's still out on where it's going, but that's a little bit of what I'm hearing and perceiving. Interesting, Mark, what's your sense of that? I, I think the challenge is no one knows the duration right now. And so my, my sense is, and I forgive the repetitiveness, there's a real opportunity to revisit your core principles, to, to, to rethink certain, re reconsider, uh, you know, obviously we have this incredible tradition. Many of us have histories, but I think it's, it's a time uh, for a little bit of a reset, if you will. Uh, and, and, and that shouldn't be threatening. It, it, there's an element of scariness to that. I, 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 you know, any kind of change can, can, can but, but I, I don't think that we're gonna go back to the way we were. I, I, I think that would be a naive uh, assumption. Uh, we, we can still be great, we can still inspire. I, I'm not conceding any of that, but, but I suspect uh, we're gonna be uh, coming out of this you know, and, and, and if the, the relationships internally and externally are strong enough, I think we can come out of this, and I don't want to say better or anything like that, because I don't want to get into value judgments, but, but it'll be different and it can be equally exciting and equally compelling. Michael? I don't think the art form is going to change profoundly, at least in terms of the theater. It's 3,000 years old. It has been through plagues before, as Esther said. I do think that the financial model with which we support it needs more flexibility and needs more um, creativity. Mark's talking about, I mean, who better to have a digital uh, a format um, than, than the BSO, but all of us are going to have to find ways of doing that, and we're certainly engaging with audiences in a way that is robust right now, but it's not the same thing. Um, I do think if you want to talk about who is going to rule the world, it is it is, if you look at all these discussions about new venues, it's the person who can figure out how to create social distancing during an intermission rush to the bathrooms. <laughs> when, you figure, when you figure that out, you come talk to me first and we will get rich. The, 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 women, will figure, the women will figure that out first. They have the most at stake. I I'm, hope. I'm told we're at the end of our time. I wanna thank you all very much uh, for participating in this. I think we've uh, a lot of food for thought here and I wanna thank our viewers as well. Everybody stay safe out there or in there. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.